Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, on the land in which we live and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So welcome everybody to the, well, the third in the series of um, presentations during Open House Melbourne weekend on Trades Hall. Uh, my name's Felicity Strong. I'm an associate at Level Chen. I worked on the interpretation and historical research of the Trades Hall building and I'm going to introduce my colleague, Stuart Hannafin. Hi, I'm Stuart. I'm an associate at Level Chen as well um, and uh, architect and I worked on the stage one project from uh, documentation right through to the completion of the construction. So uh, this afternoon uh, we'll be doing a bit of an introduction to the key parts of the building and what Level Chen has worked on, in particular our areas of expertise. You can also ask questions by uh, typing into the, the chat, in, um, into the Zoom chat. So we'll get to those as we go through. Uh, please be patient with us. Um, we'd like you to keep your microphones on, mi on mute if possible, just to keep the feedback um, to a minimum if possible. And don't forget, if we speed through areas that you want to go back and have a look at, you can access this through the Open House Melbourne website and keep an eye out for um, the little Easter eggs, as Anthony Moore from Trades Hall mentioned in his previous talk. Uh, there's a lot of information already loaded by Trades Hall um, around the site, and I understand that some information from Level Chain will be uploaded in the coming week, so keep an eye on that. So we might begin, um, we'll share our screen. Just bear with us for two seconds. There we go. So this is the view that you get of the building as you come into the Open House Melbourne website and can tour through the different elements of Trades Hall. We thought we'd begin uh, in the old, whoop, we've gone nice. outside the old council chamber. So we'll just click, there we go, in through the door. All right, so the old council chamber is in the oldest part of the, the building. It was built in the first stage of construction in 1874. It actually began as the Friendly Society's meeting room was, but it was converted for use as the council chamber in March of 1884. It's known as the old council chamber to distinguish it from a newer council chamber, um, which we'll come to later, which is been renamed um, from New Council Chamber to Solidarity Hall. Um, what we might do, this, sorry, this room is used for meetings uh, and important events, which you might run through in a minute. But Stuart, if you want to maybe show a few key elements. Yeah, so um, the old Council Chamber was, quite a bit different um, when we started uh, working on the project in 2016 um, and uh, kind of scoping the works. Um, we had a room that was in pretty poor condition and it was all painted out in a um, delightful pinky white scheme. Um, as part of that, the approach in this room was to um, restore it to its original scheme. So to support that, we had some work done by the University of Melbourne, the Brimwade Centre, um, to do some investigation of what schemes existed. So um, if you come back to the space next week, there'll be some extra little um, Easter eggs in here showing you some of the work they did. Um, of to areas uh, to the wall such as here where they very carefully um, peeled back the, the layers of the original, uh, the layers of the overpainting to reveal the decorative scheme. Um, they also did some high level work um, to uncover the frieze and a little bit of George Higginbotham up the top here. Um, so that, that allowed us to understand what um, was still there um, and also to understand what we could achieve in terms of uncovering it. Um, it's, so they were testing also techniques that could be used to um, reveal that. So what we've actually ended up here is two things. 
Um, the freeze up through to the border of the ceiling is, has been uncovered by the conservators um, during the works. Um, and from the freeze down to the floor has actually been a copy made um, of the stencil pattern and the uncovered um, dado freeze, uh, and it's been recreated on the walls. Um, that was predominantly due to the fact that the research by the conservators revealed that we would do more damage to the original paint scheme on the wall by trying to uncover it um then yeah where up in the freeze we were actually able to successfully peel away the layers of overpainting to reveal it um one of the nice little discoveries we had was there was a honor board on the wall um and fortunately when it had been overpainted no one had bothered to take the honor board off the wall um so when we took it off we were able to uncover this original section of the wall stencil pattern um, which is pretty amazing and the way the light actually casts off it um, and changes how the pattern looks is is quite spectacular so one of the interesting elements of this project has been marrying the historical research with what we actually have evidence of on site so um, if we can pull up the uh, historic photos we'll just show you some of um some of the historical material that we had so this is um what the council chamber looked like in 1884 and there's an article from the argus newspaper that described the decorative scheme and uh, as I read it out, um, and we'll go back and take another look of how it looks in, in colour, you can really understand um, where we've got to now and uh, what it must have looked like um, originally in the 1880s. The ceiling is painted with a light azure tint with broad amber belt at the edge and a bold Grecian key worked upon it. Four beautiful female heads are painted in the corners and the cornices are picked out in colours relieved by small designs. The tops of the walls are decorated with a frieze laid upon a, a pale turquoise blue ground running round the entire chamber. It bears also in the centre of each wall a portrait of some benefactor of the skilled artisan. That of Mr Justice Higginbotham occupies the post uh, of honour above the chair of the president and is facing and facing it is the portrait of Sir Charles Darling. On each side are George Stevenson and Samuel Plimsoll. The walls themselves are painted in soft neutral green, a stenciled design of large pattern being worked upon, worked upon it in a slightly warmer colour. A rich dado with dividing rail matching the border around the ceiling falls from the stencil into the ground. The doors are elaborately painted, the ground colours harmonising with the prevailing tints. On the panels of the principal entrance are painted heads of the typical British artisans surrounded by floral designs picked out in gold. Above the door is a semicircular arch filled with a fine piece of wood carving, the work of Mr Marriott of Lonsdale Street, and in the centre is a clock. There are two other doors on each side of the President's chair. These are panelled with Venetian landscapes and above the doors are two paintings, one representing science and agriculture and the other painting and sculpture. So you can see that from this historical image, a lot of what I had just described in the newspaper article. We also have other uh, illustrated depictions uh, that were published in the newspaper at the time. So this one is actually from uh, the bootmakers strike, which was uh, a very important event at the time and happened very quickly after the chamber was decorated. Uh, so you can see there's uh, some plaster busts, uh, which we have actually located. We thought that they were lost uh, over time, but they're actually they're, uh, securely looked after it. Uh, the University of Melbourne archives. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that there's a huge collection of trade union material held um, held by the University of Melbourne archives. Um, looking after archival material and historical material isn't core business of trade unions. And as the trade unions have uh, changed over time, so as they've um, joined together, some of the smaller trades no longer have their um, they're smaller unions and they've become the larger ones that we're familiar with today. So the CFMEU, for example, 
all those materials um, from those trade unions have been donated into archives. So there's a wonderful repository there and I encourage you if you're doing research to uh, go down and speak to the archives because they've got some fantastic material there. So just to show you the room before the works, Stuart, do you want to talk yeah, about so what's happened here? You can see this is after we've removed the honour board on the wall. We can also see in this photo where the Grim Wade Centre have done their little areas investigation. Um, and as you can see, it was in quite a different condition to how it is now. Um, and also had these schoolhouse pendants in there. So as part of the works, um, we, if I go back to this one, we worked with the historic photos, photo we had, um, and a light maker, and we made these pendants that were a, a replica of um, the historic um, pendant. So to try as part of bringing it back to that original scheme. We, you'll see that the timber benches, um, are not in the photo. The, the lovely cast iron seats that you see in the historic photo um, actually were moved to the new council chamber. Um, so, but as part of it, we did restore um, the benches here and refinish them. And because as with every space at Trades Hall, it is still a used working space. So while we're bringing back a very, um, decorative scheme so changing the certainly changing the look and feel of the the space we also need to make sure the functional things like the chairs and everything um are still usable by trades hall um, are there any questions that people have feel free to put them in the the chat um, and we can try our best to answer them <laughs> So one thing I didn't mention about the decorative scheme is it's actually completed by the Patterson brothers, uh, who were the preeminent decorators of the time in, um, in Melbourne. So this is what those Venetian uh, panels look like. Um, and I'm wondering, can we zoom in? Do you want to drive? <laughs> So they are quite, quite a lovely detail uh, that we've got in these rooms. Do you want to explain the tube in the corner? Oh, yes, story? there's. <laughs> yes, so the the Tobin the Tobin pipes. Um, these are actually around. They're in more than just the old council chamber. They're just a lot more decorative in here. So these were. Uh, um, 19th century air conditioning system uh, that allowed air to be drawn in at a low level and into the space. So they, they, are, they are still linked, but they're not really used it at all. Well, they're not used anymore. We've installed as part of um, the restoration to the space um, contemporary uh, air conditioning systems. Uh, but we did put back the painting paint scheme to them and the fixed up some of the the gold crowns were actually slightly damaged so they got very carefully repaired before they were re-gold leafed um so yes the when we if if we get over to the um old ballroom they also have the tobin tubes just in a different looking configuration and interestingly, the new ballroom, if we get over there, also has a, um, a natural ventilation system designed into the walls, so. I think we've also got some other pictures of uh, the conservators at work, we can show during conservation. So, so art care conservators came in and they had a team of about, between I think it was four and 12 people at a time, painstakingly um, removing the overpaint layers. And I couldn't do it myself. 
um, I wouldn't have the patience for it because they do it basically using scalpels and cotton wool on little timber skewers and they just take it off tiny, tiny little bits at a time. Um, so it's very meticulous work but and a very slow process, but the outcome is, is pretty amazing. Um, and I think too, if you think about how uncomfortable it is at the moment wearing masks, going shopping and out yeah. and about, when we visited the conservators up here, they're at the top of the scaffold. It was very hot and sweaty work and they're wearing these, these outfits. Uh, so we've got a couple of other questions. Um, someone's asked about, uh, was it just an internal restoration? Um, and about uh, renovation of bathrooms. So the stage one works were predominantly focused around the public interior spaces. Um, and it also, it also made sure it addressed the, some of the external predominantly in the form of the roof because we had um, a leaky building um, and there's no real point uh, restoring it if we don't fix the um, roof first. So externally, it was predominantly the roof, um, and then the rest of it was more of an internal... I've lost my window here. It was an uh, internal... Um, here we go, I'll show you. So, uh, it, yeah, around the internal spaces. So if we, as we're in the old council chamber, let me just step back into the middle here. Um, when we started in here, there was a whole section of the ceiling here where we'd actually lost it due to water ingress and it had been patched up. So there was actually no original decoration left up here. Um, and the, these were, I guess, the core issues that we, had to address as part of the stage one works of making sure the building was completely watertight. Um, we did also um, reno, well, we actually installed some new bathrooms. So if we go over to Solidarity Hall, then I'll just jump into the 3D. Um, so if we head over to Solidarity Hall, um, and if I show you, I'll just show you what it looked like at the start because it'll help understand, help explain. Um, so the start, Solidarity Hall at the start was orientated um, east-west and it was a larger space so it actually extended, um, if we go back to the fly-through now, it actually extended so the stage was at this end and it extended beyond this wall here. So as part of the works, we um, put in some new bathrooms um, at the, where part of the auditorium was um, in order to get more, I guess the key there is getting more bathrooms into the space so it can support the amount of people that um, attend the, the events. Um, we've also got, uh, was one needed? So um, someone's asked a question about a building surveyor. Yes, um, there was definitely a building surveyor involved. Um, and as part of that as well, uh, as part of the stage one works, we had to apply for a couple of things from a couple of different authorities. So. First and foremost, we had to submit our proposal to Heritage Victoria because um, the building is on the Victorian Heritage Register. So any works to the building either require a permit or a permit exemption. So um, we applied for a permit for all of the stage one works. Um, we also had a planning permit as part of the works and then of course a building permit from the building survey. Um, Oh, okay. we'll, we'll go back to the... We've old. got a request to go back and have yeah. another look at old council chamber. Yeah. Oh, this is... Yeah. There we go. 
Uh, and there was a question about the type of paint. The type of paint. So the type of paint that was used was um, an eggshell acrylic. So it's a very um, flat paint um, and uh, is, a, I guess, closest, as close as we can be in terms of the gloss level to, um, or the flatness of the paint to what a traditional paint was. So, um, yeah. So, and then the, so we did, the conservators um, looked at samples of, cross-sectional samples of the, um, from their investigation works and determined uh, Munsell colours, um, which then were also aligned to the dual arts um, atlas of colours so that we could work with, um, so we could match the colours appropriately. Um, there's all, and where the conservators did the uncovery work, they hand mixed paints to uh, allow them to infill cracks very carefully um, and uh, little missing chips of paint to the um, Just gonna go back to the stencil. Quite like this photo here. There we go. Zoom in, yeah, so you can you can see there how the conservators have labelled up the parts, and then they've taken cross section samples and paint colour comparisons. Um, uh, yes, we did have to deal with lead paint and uh, hazardous materials generally throughout the building. So um, a lot of the wherever we were doing works, we were cleaning out any hazardous materials. Um, and then with the lead paint, it, we, the multiplex were the builder um, and they had very, very tight controls about how the lead paint was managed um, in both in the works generally, but also in the new painting works. So, um, Places like the old council chamber, we actually didn't really disturb the on the main walls the paint um, because it was painted over with the the recreated stencil pattern. So um, that I guess it still has to be managed, and um, especially where you've got prep work to other surfaces throughout the building, um, the approach is generally to assume that there is lead paint. Uh, everywhere you're working, so. We might move back into yep. Solidarity Hall, so that's, yep. I might let you, <laughs> might let you drive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as we mentioned at the start, Old Council Chamber was the primary, primary meeting point for uh, the trade union movement within the building, in the first part of the building. Um, it was actually the Trades Hall, as we know today, was actually constructed across 10 stages from 1874 until the 60s. There was an original, um, an earlier Trades Hall building uh, in the 1850s uh, that this one replaced. So, and that, um, that came out of the eight hour movement. So you do see those 1850s dates, but this main building that we're looking at now began being constructed in 1874. So we're now in Solidarity Hall. Uh, this was constructed as part of the fourth stage of the hall um, in 1890. Uh, you may be aware that there was a fire in the chamber in um, 1963, which resulted in what we first came across and what many people are, are familiar with how New Council Chamber or Solidarity Hall used to look. Uh, we did have we did have some historical photos giving us an idea of what what the building looked like. Oh, yep. So there's a historical photo. So that's actually um, that same north wall that we were looking at. We weren't entirely sure of the date of that historical photo. Um, do you want to yeah, open up the? So this is the fire. Um, so it was in 
uh, July, uh, 30th of July, 1963. And you can see the ceiling has fallen in. Um, a, lot, a lot of the furniture and um, as I mentioned before, we thought uh, the sculptures, uh, we thought they had been destroyed in the fire. Uh, there wasn't great records of what had actually happened. Um, in the newspaper, it suggested uh, uh, it had um, started in an adjacent office of the Fibrous Plasters Union. Um, and there's a few kind of myths going around about how the fire started, who started the fire, but this was the result. Um, and so after, after the fire, the chamber was rebuilt into the fabulous 60s. Um, colour scheme, lots of browns uh, and you can see those the green cladding on the side there. Um, let's grab another picture. And so as part of the works we started removing the cladding and got a glimpse of what was underneath. So yeah there. so we we knew there was something on the north wall um, but we only had this little glimpse of it. Um, so as part of once we had a builder on site, we very quickly got them to strip the whole wall um, so we could understand the extent of what was there um, and um, decide on how we were going to uh, present it. Um, and incorporate it into the design. And we were very, very fortunate in that what we found was the extent that we were hoping for. Um, and you, so you can see there, that is the original north wall that had been covered up. And this is the line of the original chamber here um, with in the 60s, how they extended it out further. So if we go back to here, um, you can see the restored north wall. So here we took a different um, approach to what we did in the old council chamber. In the old council chamber where we were recreating the original scheme and uncovering um, the upper sections and restoring it back. Um, in the in Solidarity Hall, we left it more as a as it was um, and what we did is we infilled missing bits of decoration let me see if I can navigate my way upstairs bear with me Let's see if we can get a better view oh these are fantastic things so you can see here where we've got sections of the pilasters that are original and then sections where we've made copies of the original and we've put that cast element back where it was missing so that you can understand what the wall looked like as a whole without necessarily us completely recreating it and making it look like new. So again, um, this involved very careful work by both um, conservators and artisanal painters. Um, and here, the conservators worked very carefully to um, clean and re-adhere the um, and stabilise the paint scheme um, that was there. Um, and then after we'd um, and filled the missing elements. We had the um, artisanal painter come in and very carefully paint those elements in a, um, I guess, a sympathetic colour that allows you to uh, allows them to be read as new infills without necessarily standing out too strongly. So it's it's a very careful balance. Um, so I think that's a, one of the sad things is whilst we did manage to keep the wall in the post sixties work. The process of them actually putting the cladding up when we uncovered it, they made huge big holes in the wall. So it was, it was a bit of a, a challenge. But what I wanted to talk about 
is to show you that historical photo again um, and just a bit of research that we undertook to, to actually date, um, date the decorative scheme and Sorry, our computer's just a bit. Oh, it's a ginormous <laughs> photo, very high quality photo. That so one. we can zoom in. Yeah. So this photo was always assumed to have been taken uh, in the 1890s um, after the room was uh, first constructed. But actually, after uncovering the wall and taking a closer look at some of the decorative scheme, we've discovered that it was actually decorated in 1911. So 20 years after the, um, the room was first uh, decorated. It's one of those anomalies that, and it, it's something that happens throughout the building and one of the reasons why the building was constructed in so many stages is as money was flowing in to the union movement, um, they poured that into the building and times were tough. So 1890s is an economic depression in Melbourne. You're not gonna spend lots of money on a decorative scheme. So I'll show you some close-ups of so if you attended Anthony's tour, he mentioned these as well as before. So this one, this has got the date. So this is actually, when we got up close, you can see it says dedicated C. Gray Secretary, THC, Trades Hall Council, 1911. It's a fantastic, as far as that one goes, apologies. Here we go. So Anthony mentioned this one as well, and this one's quite fantastic. This is the names of the artisan painters who worked on the decorative scheme in 1911. And one of the really uh, fun things about doing a bit more research about this was actually matching these names with the records from the University of Melbourne archives. So when I pulled out the uh, the 1911 minute books and receipt books for Trades Hall Council. Uh, it talked about these um, these painters um, and getting paid on site, which is a, quite a lovely uh, discovery. The other interesting uh, name here is uh, W. Dunstan, um, and there is another photo I'll try and find uh, where he actually signs it. W. Dunstan, 1911 original design. Now the name Dunstan is. Um, as an important name in uh, Union banner painting. So Dunstan actually painted a number of banners for the trade union movement, uh, actually after he did this, uh, this work at Trades Hall. And I, I like to think he got his banner commissions because he did such a wonderful job um, in the new council chamber. But once again, if we can maybe go back to a room image, uh, I thought I might read you the, um, read you the write up of the, the decorations of the hall uh, in 1911. This is from the Australasian decorator and painter. The council chamber of the Trades Hall Melbourne has been renovated and redecorated. The ceiling is laid out in panels of light cream and finished with lines, ornaments, moldings and cornice in suitable tints in shades of green, pink and blue. The ceiling lights have been reglazed with muffled glass in crimson, amber and green tints. A frieze of bold design is in red and maroon and yellow tones, which give the scheme of colouring, uh, of colouring a rich effect. The most pleasing features, however, are over the president's chair, the wall, which lent itself to decoration, which have been laid out with the panels of flowers and vases bearing the labour motto 888, bunches of flowers and ornaments ornamentation in fold with a monogram THC in place. Tablets are also shown on the walls with the names of the pioneers of the 1856 and past presidents of councils in shade of, shades of pink and cream and blue and art green outlined in gold, the pilasters adorning same being finished in cream, green and chocolate with gold caps and bases. The flower painting was done by Mr. W. Dunstan. Vases and scrolls round the gallery balustrade serve to heighten the effect and the dado right round the chamber has been stained and finished with black varnish. The whole work has been carried out under the supervision of Mr. W. H. Dow. So we have another question. 
um, asking how do you decide where to try and restore errors to their original look and where to show something as new, such as the decorative columns? It's, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, it's also a very interesting process and generally involves a lot of um, discussion um, and investigation. So I guess firstly, it's understanding what's, what the condition of the space is and what, um, what could be restored or couldn't be. Um, and then it's, it, is, it was quite a few discussions between ourselves um, with Trades Hall about what the space um, could be um, and also involving Heritage Victoria um, and taking them along for the journey as well so that they understand where the thinking behind it is all coming from. So if you take the old council chamber, for example, we knew we had, um, due to the conservators investigation, we knew we had a lot of um, original schemes we could uncover. We knew there was the scheme on the wall that while we couldn't um, uncover it, we certainly knew what it looked like and we knew the colors of it. So the old council chamber, we could actually bring that space back to that period of time. Um, where in the Solidarity Hall, we really only had the this element on the north wall that was left of the original um, auditorium. So the whole east wall had been demolished in the 60s to extend it out. The roof had been completely taken off and reworked at, in that 60s scheme. So it, I guess we were working with quite a different, um, two, two really different um, conditions. Uh, and the, the, I think the end result in both is fantastic. Um, one where you really get to experience how it was and one where you can see the history in the space and the strategy to infill the missing bits of the plaster is, is more about assisting people in understanding how it would have looked. Um, without necessarily trying to, I guess, restore it to that perfect. Because I think it would have been a, a real missed opportunity, while we probably could have done it, um, to restore the North Wall to look almost new. I think part of what really makes the space is that it is that, um, that element that shows the history behind it, shows what happened to it. And it's more of a, I guess, a remnant of the chamber that was there. Just Hopefully that answers your question. Have a look, what else we've got from the during the works? Oh yeah, so the behind the scenes um, with the scaffolding up close up to the wall. So these are the hard plasterers um, working away as they're infilling the sections here. And you can see how it's a much darker color when it first went in. And even that was a journey um, of the color it went in at. And then we actually had to take the scaffold away, um, have the space under the new lights, and then look at the wall again to understand what it looked like and whether it was achieving what we hoped it would achieve. And that's where the artists and painters came in to come back and actually fine tune the color of that. So yeah, there's a close up. And here there's some interesting work that has to be done between the plaster and the conservators as well, where we're the conservators are installing a special protection to the edge of where the new plaster work is going in that can be removed from the original paint without damaging it um, and still allowing the plasterers to do the work they need to do. A couple more 
there's any more questions, happy to answer them. Right, so you can see some of the damage. Yeah, and here's where the conservators have started to clean um, the, the scheme. So this is this is once we've done the major amount of works to it, but hadn't yet um, done any of the careful painting out of the new plaster. But now getting to actually look at it under light um, and see what it what it might look like. Just one more, just talking about the damage that was uncovered. Um, never really understood why they <laughs> they left the wall, um, but kind of you can see up the top here, the insertion straight in, yeah. um, which explains the the, the damage um, to the wall when we uncovered it. So if there's no more questions, there is. Oh, yep. yep. <laughs> uh, so someone's asked the time frame for the work so um we started uh as an office working here in 2016 um the yeah, sorry having to think back in time now it's a, uh the contractor started on site in early to mid 2018 um and they finished up mid to late 2019. Um, so it's been just over a year now since um, since the project was completed. So um, yes, it is <laughs> it is stage one. So someone's also asked how it was funded um, and who the contractor was. So um, Trades Hall were given a grant through the Living Heritage program um, with Heritage Victoria um, and that funded um, a substantial portion of the works. Trades Hall also contributed themselves to the overall project um, and the contractor who undertook the works, the head contractor, was Multiplex um, and yes, um, what work was done to the building? So services wise we did um, lots of exciting work like uh, bringing fire services to compliance, electrical um, services, upgrades. We, as I mentioned earlier, we put in new bathrooms, we put in heating and cooling to all these spaces because previously none of the um, public spaces had any heating and cooling. So um, that was a pretty big change for the building. Um, if you caught and Anthony's uh, guided tour this morning, he will have mentioned stage two. So um, stage two is hopefully gonna commence very soon um, with some actual works. And in stage two, it's focused around the um, executive um, wing of the building and where the staff is situated. So it's, if I jump into the, so I think, where we're so areas like the executive meeting room you can still see there's um so this will be one of the spaces that gets looked at in stage two and you can see on the wall there's there's certainly some work needing to be done and while we made sure we fix the roof in stage one there's still plenty of restoration work to be done throughout the building um and stage two doesn't even finish the building so there's there's some amazing spaces that um, Anthony talked about as well. Where in the so you can see here we've got some uh, painted honour boards, um, and you can see that on this side over here. If we jump a bit closer, again you can see some investigations been done in the past and. It's, un, it's believed that there are another set of painted honour boards on this wall here. So there's certainly um, 
plenty more to do at this building and there'll be some pretty exciting uncovery work in the future um, for Trades Hall as they hopefully work their way through the building. Um, so the, the stage one, the key difference between stage one and stage two was stage one really focused on the four uh, main public use rooms. So old council chamber, new council chamber, Solidarity Hall. Uh, old ballroom and new ballroom. Let's so we might just show you the ballrooms. Um, I will say when you go back and kind of look at this tour yourself, make sure you do check out uh, on the mezzanine level uh, and certainly when you're in the building uh, in the future, the Workers' Museum that's gone in as well. Anthony gave a little tour of that today, um, but you can also walk through that area as well. So we're now in uh, what a lot of us fondly remember as the Bella Union Bar. This is uh, this is now known as Common Room. Yep. Um, and for me, the most exciting bit about this is this wonderful ceiling, which uh, I must admit, at Bella, I had never looked at the ceiling properly. Um, but if I had, it would have seen it was just this awful. It was just painted white. Um, yep. So. So this is what the room used to look like. Um, and it's just uh, the contrast with the beautiful wood panelling on the ceiling is yeah. just spectacular. Maybe you can explain more. Yeah, so again, we did a bit of investigation and we knew there was a proper timber ceiling under, under the paint. Um, and here, the space we, so we, we undertook a lot of paint removal here to actually reveal that original ceiling. Um, and then we did all the belts and braces kind of work of getting air conditioning and getting the electrical done, um, fixing up the floor, refinishing it, repainting it. Um, here you can see the Tobin tubes that exist in this space as well. Um, and these each tube directly links to a vent on the outside of the building. Um, so someone's just asked about Anthony's tour. They actually did theirs as a Facebook Live uh, tour this morning. So we'll have to maybe keep an eye out on the Trades Hall Facebook page to see they may have recorded it. Um, so apologies for those who missed yes. out. Um, but the interesting and important thing about the doing the public spaces in stage one is uh, Trades Hall now have uh, fringe, Melbourne fringe, um, back into these spaces. So by, um, by targeting the public spaces first, it allows Trades Hall to reopen to the community and uh, with, they have the comedy festival in um, you know, Melbourne fringe now. Um, which means the second stage, which I guess is the, the less sexy stage, is the back end, the, the offices, and probably for the people who work there, the most important bit. Looking forward to having some proper heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, what we term the new ballroom, but it has also been um, renamed the ETU ballroom. Um, so here, Again, it was a very belts and braces bit of work because this is a very functional, multi-purpose space for the hall um, and for people like Fringe Festival and Comedy Festival. So this, um, I believe, has union delegate meetings in it. It has comedy events in it. It has all sorts of performances in it. So um, here again, we were doing lights, we were doing air conditioning. We did have some fun though with Trades Hall and um, we designed a custom pendant with them um, that brings in some key things that you'll see hidden around and it's, it's a bit hard to see, but there's actually three eights on the very bottom of the pendant. Um, and we've got wattle leaves throughout the pendant. So these were, um, yeah, a bespoke piece for the space. Um, and they can actually be taken down um, to allow the flexibility needed for the, for the 
Ah, oh, yes, behind me. Yeah. <laughs> so there, it's still, there's a door here that goes to nowhere that allows for the bringing in of large objects into the space. Um, there we go. Someone's just posted that the tour is available on Facebook if you visit the Victorian Trades Hall Council Facebook page. So yeah, that's definitely worth it because Anthony's tour talks more about the historical events that had mm -hmm. um, have occurred in Trades Hall over the years, some colourful characters uh, and evidence of which you can see throughout throughout the hall. But just having a look at this, there's some lovely little details. See the little ETU stenciling in the windows. And as we entered the, uh, the ETU ballroom, you might have also seen a, the, a custom uh, light art. Um, turn around. Which uh, is, yes. There we are. There, there. We did a, a neon. Um, so if the if the room's in use, the light is glowing. So, um, which is rather nice. And the other thing we did as part of this is when when we started here, there was um, a bathroom at the landing there and a bathroom straight in front of us here. Um, and in order to get from the main set of stairs up to the ballrooms to Solidarity Hall, you actually had to go back downstairs and out um, and up through the stair in the, the first wing of the building, which I'll take you to in a second. But we've, so we've opened up this link again um, and installed a lift and there's now a, um, DDA compliant access from the street as well. So there's a platform lift so that every it opens up the space to the public. Um, so this is some of trades halls. Yeah, so these are reproductions of uh, trade union posters over the years. Um, so there's some lovely uh, interpretive content throughout um, throughout the building and they've kept, when we first started in uh, Old Council Chamber, you would have seen there was some decals. Uh, one of them um, on a Zelda de Prano, who's an important uh, female activist. And the other one was the shooting of um, Constable McGrath um, and Trades Hall. You can see there's a dot where we're just looking down there. Uh, these are thought to be bullet holes from the shootout at Trades Hall. So this is a good reminder when you're going through the building yourself to, um, to yeah. click on these yeah. little Easter eggs, as Anthony called them, um, and find out a bit more about, about the, the mythology and the history of the events that have taken place here. And, um, and one thing we all like to point out is the, the blue stone steps, the, yes. ha, the, um, the, the evidence of where, I yeah. guess. Um, so you can see here, it's the, the, the 3D tour doesn't quite do it justice. I'd thoroughly recommend um, if you get an opportunity to come to the building in the future, just to walk these stairs and see how worn they, it really is. Yeah. And you can even see it up here, how they, the amount of feet that have walked these stairs um, is pretty amazing. Um, and the, the legend behind that big chunk of missing stair is a, a beer keg being uh, rolled down the stairs after a, a labour victory at a celebration um, at Trades Hall. And I think that's what's so interesting about this building is it bears the, um, the physical evidence of a really rich and interesting history. I think many people even today have memories of coming on election night, losses or wins, uh, and celebrating in this building. Um, really is a fantastic, fantastic yeah. building. If anyone's got any questions, we've got about five minutes left. So please, if you've got a request to see something that we haven't looked at. You can see in this um, photo image here, the uh, Workers Museum on either side. Um, the Trades Hall have done a, an audio component. So um, when you do get to visit, you can pick up those little receivers and listen to uh, the stories that go along with each case. And what was interesting about this part of the project was uh, 
Lovell Chen were able to help Trades Hall um, secure some of the artifacts and items back from um, the University of Melbourne archives. So um, whilst they've looked after them for many years, um, there was a desire from Trades Hall to have them back, back home um, and on display in the building. And so those items are now back on, on display, including um, the bust. <laughs> he's been, um, he's been, yeah, you can't see the face on the bus. Yeah, the technology, <laughs> auto-blurring faces. Um, so that's come from Melbourne Uni Archives. There's also uh, a set of armour, which you can see just up here. This has come back from the archives as well. Um, the question here, is that an 8884 carpet? It is. So this is a um, carpet we um, designed with Trades Hall for the project um, and will be used in the next stage as well. Um, as we change over the carpet. So we've got the triple eights um, and the rows. And if we quickly jump you down to the main area, the main entry, sorry. Try to spin this. So in the main, the carpet is also used where we restored the, or changed over the finishes, uh, the floor finishes in the main reception. So, and we've got the bread and the pattern there as well. We also put down new flooring in the main foyer here, including the, um, the Trades Hall Council crest. Mm. Or one of the older crests. Have we got any more questions? Any final questions? Got three, three minutes left. Any other questions? Yeah, there is, no. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, we certainly have enjoyed working on this project and are. Uh, enjoying working on stage two. And if you talk to Trades Hall, they have lots of big plans that they would like to continue to do to the building. It's one of those challenges of being a, a working Trades Hall building. Um, but yeah, thank you for attending. Yep. And make sure you check out uh, the videos on Open House Melbourne and also hopefully some of the additional content that we mm. have provided will get loaded in the next week or so. So that will kind of change up a bit um yeah. yeah thank you for coming on a sunday yeah really appreciate it and hopefully you're off to another open house tour for the rest of your afternoon hopefully you got a few more booked in yeah great brilliant thanks everybody thanks.